And welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, that website is Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. If you'd like to learn all about the Second Realm Network uh, that we're building. Uh, as a reminder, we do have ghost pads and ghost phones available for purchase uh, on the Liberty and Attack Publications website uh, for those looking to step up their security culture uh, in the digital second realm with privacy-hardened devices courtesy of our friend Jamie Baconic. Uh, and as always, we do have incredible books on self-liberation, whether you're searching for strategy guides uh, like Second Realm Book on Strategy uh, or my book, Vanya's Strategy for Self-Liberation, uh, or even great anarchist uh, agorist fiction such as uh, Todd Borjo's The Evolution Trilogy, uh, which I've completed the first two books of and uh, highly recommend. And uh, 2048, uh, Matthew Otecki's newest installment uh, in his Brushfire Thriller series. Uh, anyway, a couple weeks ago, I had another one of my, uh, I guess, wild ideas. Uh, so uh, here's the setup. Uh, Pasnians will need access to KYC-free Bitcoin, as everyone else will at some point. Uh, and mining is a great way to provide for that. A uh, possible future perk of joining as a founding or vetted stakeholder, you may be the first 20 people, um, could be access to X number of Satoshis per month. Um, this way, there's no you know selling of Bitcoin, but rather it's just another perk of uh, joining the Pasnia Cooperative, just like discounted organic eggs uh, or soon uh, raw dairy. Uh, it's another way to fund the, uh, fund developments in the second realm, uh, as well as to to contribute to the overall security of the Bitcoin network, which I think is a uh, a great thing. Uh, I even saw a thread of someone using their uh, a Twitter thread of uh, someone using their Bitcoin miner to get paid to heat their house in the winter. Uh, I guess by running some ventilation ducts from the miner. Um, but uh, yeah, truly fucking brilliant, and uh, just the sort of thinking that is necessary uh, in this area. I also think it'd be a wise idea to have a little Bitcoin mining 101 discussion. I, I mean, I know I have, like, a, I guess, a, um, a basic understanding of it. And over, you know, it's it's been long enough. I'm sure some of you have a pretty good, a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, um, understanding of, uh, you know, what that train, what that, what that looks like. But uh, um, we haven't really dove deep into that specifically. So um, anyway, yeah, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Alex Dishinger. Uh, 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 he goes by Tucson Bitcoin on Twitter. Um, he's uh, one of the hosts of the Toxic Airwaves podcast, a uh, show I recently had the pleasure of being a guest on, uh, as well as an entrepreneur and educator uh, within the Bitcoin realm. Um, I'll have him provide a more comprehensive introduction and uh, background, but um, that'll suffice for now. Um, like I mentioned a moment ago, uh, we'll do a little Bitcoin Mining 101 session, uh, talk about KYC-free Bitcoin for Pasnians, uh, figure out you know the uh, logistics of setting up uh, the great Pasnian Bitcoin mines, and uh, whatever else we get to, but uh, that's a uh, damn good start. And uh, at the end of the episode, I'll extend an offer to any Pasnians listening. Uh, is this a project you'd like to uh, contribute your time and uh, expertise to? Uh, let's talk about uh, arrangements and potentially other sources of, uh, you know, side sets. Uh, anyway, Alex, welcome to the Vonnie Podcast, my friend. Uh, how are things going today? Going pretty good. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's uh, definitely great to have you. Definitely great to have you. And like I said in the introduction, it was uh, it was great to chat with you uh, a number of weeks back uh, over on uh, on your podcast, Talk- Toxic Airwaves. But I guess uh, do you want to start with uh, um, with that? So, you know, uh, maybe a, a little background uh, introduction to who you are and uh, what you do. Sure. So I work in the Bitcoin mining industry. I've uh, it's relatively new for me, about six months. I've only been mining myself for about six months. It's been something I've wanted to get into for a while and have been kicking myself because there were times in the past where I had opportunities to use free electricity um, in my living situation. I just didn't get into it because I didn't know where to go buy a miner or, you know, the entire process seemed kind of overwhelming. Uh, but yeah, I've been into Bitcoin for about four years. Uh, it's a lot to take in a, a huge rabbit hole to get down and every day it's just um learning something new and recently in the past year i've become very interested in uh privacy uh preserving technologies and i think bitcoin fits into that uh pretty well but yeah yeah definitely definitely so i guess um uh that's a, a good little introduction there but uh how how did you uh, first come across bitcoin i mean what was your i guess uh, your your path into the realm of liberation i guess a little more of your uh, you know your story here per se well i would say that uh public school was my path towards liberation getting treated like uh a scum uh my entire childhood by teachers and stuff like that that's what uh de-radicalized me. I think statism is one of the most radical ideologies and anarchism is 
very, very, or just the idea of volunteerism is very, um, it's not radical. Uh, and I like to frame it that way because people think anarchism is like this crazy mm -hmm. idea, but yeah, Bitcoin, I was, uh, 2018, uh, 2017, I was, uh, going to school and working to study, to become a social worker. Uh, and I knew I was going to be poor, uh, doing that, never make any money. So I was interested in ways to, uh, save and you know get my finances in order and so i got into dave ramsey a bit and yeah i don't know how exactly i found bitcoin uh probably somewhere on youtube and just went down the rabbit hole more and more so and it i was i've always been you know somewhat libertarian or anarchist minded but the philosophy had never uh been explained to me or I've never ran across it. I was just like, you know, the police suck. Uh, the government's insane. Uh, I can't be trusted. I like guns. I like freedom. Um, and Bitcoin kind of led me to that, you know, Bitcoin led me to Rothbard, to Mises, to, um, eventually Larkin Rose, you know, uh, I found your podcast because you did the audiobook, uh, sedition, subversion, sabotage by, uh, Ben Stone, yeah. uh, which is not one of my favorite books, but yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. That's, uh, it's awesome to hear. Um, and so I guess, um, when, when did uh, toxic airwaves come about then? Um, when did you decide to, uh, start a, a podcast, uh, um, or I guess a call-in show it's, it's more, more so. Yeah. So my, my co-host, I, I was looking to do, um, I, at the time, I was just doing your typical Bitcoin podcast that wasn't very creative. I'd get people on and interview them, which was a really good experience, uh, you know, because it helped me learn a lot. To, it gives me it gave me an excuse to ask some of the most interesting uh, people in the space to come and let me ask them questions for an hour. Uh, so that was a pretty good experience, but it wasn't very different than the thousand other Bitcoin podcasts that are out there. So I wanted to do something different. I, I wanted a co-host to do it with. There was a guy at the local Bitcoin meetup uh, that I ran into and asked him to, he was local to where I lived and I asked him to do a show with me. And a lot of it was his idea um, as far as the format and the style of it. And it turned into this kind of hilarious uh, mm -hmm. uh, parody of conservative AM radio uh, that's, you know, focused on Bitcoin and anarchism. So that's how that came about. Nice. I like that. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely dig that. Um, I definitely dig that. So um, I guess let, let's get into and get into mining here. So my, my experience with mining, never, never mind Bitcoin. I mined a, a couple, a few shit coins a number of years back. And um, a friend of mine and I were going to, um, he had just gotten into, uh, gotten into, into so-called cryptocurrencies, not definitely not just Bitcoin only. And he, you know, got in at the right time and made like three X his money pretty quickly. And he was like, I want to like invest more. So we were thinking about getting, going in on, on a miner. Thankfully it didn't, didn't transpire. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I really don't have any experience beyond, like, it's, you, you download download the software, you kind of set up how many cores you want to run and how much CPU you want to commit to, um, I guess the mining and, and uh, so yeah that's like the extent of my experience is very very minimal so um possibly some of uh, the listeners might not be too familiar with too so i guess um i guess could you talk a little bit about mining like, you know what's uh, what's what role does it play in the uh, in, in the bitcoin ecosystem and and i guess also i guess the what what happens uh, with the process yeah so mining is the way i describe it to people that are new it's turning electricity into money um so the the bitcoin protocol is essentially like what the miners are doing is they're throwing up a bunch of cryptographic hashes to try and find and solve the next block uh, and a block is just a series of transactions within a certain time period so uh, the bitcoin protocol tries to have a block come through every 10 minutes so if i sent you a transaction right now there would be a fee associated with it. It would get processed depending on, you know, what the fee I put on it. But say I 
put a higher fee on it, it'll get to you and get finalized within 10 minutes. Uh, that fee will then go to the miners who process the transaction. And yeah, there's also a subsidy uh, put on each block uh, called a block reward that gets cut, cut in half every four years that incentivizes the miners to um, go and compete to process these transactions. And so it, it's really a cool system, uh, cool economic incentives where uh, the, the more computing power that's on the network and the more distributed that computing power is, the more secure uh, the network is. So essentially what can happen is if one person gets uh, majority control over the network. They can cause a lot of disruptions to the network. They can uh, mess around with transactions. They can, you know, do all of these things. It wouldn't necessarily kill the, the entire protocol, but it would be extremely disruptive uh, for a short period of time. Uh, but what ends up happening is because it's economical or economically viable to mine and you have people all over the world trying to race to get as much hardware online to get as much Bitcoin as possible. And because that block subsidy gets cut in half every four years, it means the longer you wait to get in, the less Bitcoin uh, you get as a result of it. So it's a pretty cool system. Hmm. Um, very, very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, and I'll be honest, I mean, I, I've been into Bitcoin for a little while for, you know, since probably 20, I guess, more, I guess, more heavily since like 2016. But like, I, I didn't even re I didn't, I guess, realize, I guess, the energy tie into it. That's like, guess the, the significance of that, that connection to it of energy. Um, I watched uh, and I mentioned it because someone dropped it in the Pasnia telegram, um, telegram chat. But uh, um, when Jordan Peterson had that uh, conversation with Seyfedina Moose, and they went really, really deep into um I don't really care for either of them that much, but like that was an important, a valuable connection I really hadn't made is like it's the connection with Bitcoin and energy. So, um, yeah, so like that, that's even, even with, with being in the space for, for this long, I still hadn't, hadn't realized that there's still, and that's why, um, you know, even though mining is like, I, I understand like the overview and the basics and a lot, a lot of people probably do. Um, when you get, when you go down the rabbit hole of like what, whatever thing, like there's, there's so much nuance and. Uh, important things that you might miss out on if you're just kind of getting a you know a, i guess a, an overarching um just an overarching i guess overview of it rather than actually going into it so i guess do you do you want to say anything anything more about the i guess the the mining and energy and, and bit and bitcoin connection there sure yeah i'm glad you mentioned uh Saifedean, uh because his his book the bitcoin standard uh is what really made things click for me and so if somebody's new for bitcoin new to bitcoin i'd suggest that book but yeah uh the energy usage of bitcoin is incredibly important uh because what it does is it ties this digital asset to the real world and like part of the reason why gold became a valuable currency in the past is because it was expensive to extract and that expense to um, create more of it limited the ability of new gold coming online or coming into circulation and you know bitcoin is similar in that regard uh for sure so mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely yeah, I mean, the idea of a digital okay yeah oh go ahead man oh i was just gonna say the idea of a digital asset having value uh you know is a pretty <laughs> interesting concept and like all of these people right now are talking about real estate in the metaverse and uh jpegs with cryptographic hashes called nfts and they're really really silly and dumb uh but bitcoin i think part of the reason why it has value is because it's tied to the real world yeah yeah true so i guess just uh, an interesting thing that comes to mind uh, i've been, i've been looking into really deeply um i guess the the topic of, of breakthrough energy uh decentralized energy and uh there's a guy I interviewed a, a number of weeks back named sky huddleston who um is working on i guess it's like a megawatt generator for every house using a i guess a, a modified bork engine with no moving parts and um i wonder what um impact that will have like if if electricity if the cost of electricity goes down to like basically nothing 
um, to where he's, he's saying you know, like using charcoal slushy as the as the fuel source, um, like just very basic shit. Um, like I wonder what impact that would have on um, on Bitcoin mining and and, and, and and on the Bitcoin mining mining sphere. Do you have any thoughts on that? I guess more if it's kind of uh, not not free energy. That's not the right word for it because there's obviously cost that goes into it. But um, I guess the the breakthrough energy. Um, I guess the that connection there. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting concept and we'll get to the Bitcoin mining implications in a moment. Uh, there's this really good book called the moral case for fossil fuels by Alex Epstein. And, you know, he talks a lot about the importance of cheap and available and reliable electricity. And there's a bunch of psychopaths that want to come in and limit people's uh, ability to consume electricity and fossil fuels in general, which is a direct attack on sovereignty. It's like one of the best ways to, uh, and, and freedom, it's one of the best ways to control and manipulate people because it's going to impact um, your ability to consume as well as produce and uh, travel, which is pretty insane. So that idea of like having your own way to generate electricity uh, not necessarily be reliable on the state or, uh, you know, these power or power companies is extremely exciting. Um, and I hope that that moves a lot faster. But yeah, having access to cheap electricity and how that impacts your ability to, to mine and what that would do to the Bitcoin network, um, it's going to send up hash rate obviously um and i think one of the biggest restrictions for uh, everybody getting into mining is just the limitations of hardware uh that's out there and it's inaccessible to a lot of people like if you go out and you buy um one of the newer generation machines today in your pleb you're going to need extremely inexpensive electricity, like three to five cents to be able to ROI on that machine um, in Bitcoin. And so one of the, the first steps that's incredibly important, you know, when you're looking at miners is the price in Bitcoin versus the price in dollars, because you might ROI in dollars, but dollars are a completely meaningless metric right. um, or measurement you want to acquire as much Bitcoin. But yeah, I mean, I think everybody should be heating their houses with uh, Bitcoin miners. Uh, if you have electric heating, uh, it's extremely expensive and it provides you no uh, value other than just heating your home. And you can accomplish the same thing with Bitcoin miners. So I think that's pretty interesting. And same goes for, you know, heating pools and hot tubs and, uh, you know, whatever else. Um, there's a ton of different, you know, hacks that you can come uh, you can accomplish with miners uh, because they produce an extreme amount of heat. And so that, mm -hmm. like that ability to lower um, electricity costs would definitely make things a lot more accessible to the average person, uh, which would be extremely exciting. But uh, I mean, that just opens up a whole new door of possibilities that we can't even, you know, understand for the average person. So that, that's an right. extremely exciting direction to go right yeah that's uh that's that's uh um yeah well said i guess the the thing that comes to mind for me is you know referencing that conversation with sky again um i guess the the premise behind or what has to happen first is um easier access to rare earth minerals and then the price for solar panels will be cheaper than like shingles and shit so why would you ever put shingles on when you can just put solar panels on for the same cost and actually be like you don't really care how much they're generating because it's just like a backup and it's there right so like that i i kind of think about like you know <laughs> hyper bitcoinization being that way where it's like why the why the fuck aren't you going to run a why aren't you why aren't you going to mine bitcoin it's like um like it's just if you can generate electricity you know uh, you know generate money with it um or generate um you know you get what I'm saying. If you can do it, then why not? Where it just becomes like a standard way of doing things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I heated my my entire home this winter with uh, miners and Jesus. people in colder climates. I'm in Arizona. People in colder climates do it all the time. And I think it's absolutely fantastic when you can uh, reuse that heat to, you know, be comfortable through the winter while making money on top of that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Definitely brilliant. Um, 
Very good. So I guess um, let's talk a little bit about because um, the, the the reason we're not the the only experience I have mining, um, and the reason I I did it was because I had a spare laptop laying around, and you know like um, it was I guess it was for, for I think I, I I mined Monero and one or two other ones I can't recall just a couple of shit coins I don't even think are out there anymore, but uh, um, yeah I never bought a miner um, I never you know I, I never did that and I I on Twitter I see every single day it seems there's new mining companies doing interesting things so I could you give us like a, I guess an overview on uh, what's available for you know personal mining um, or I guess home mining. Um, at this current moment in time, because I know it's kind of it's probably going to be a lot different in a year or two, but at least for the, for this moment. Sure. So, uh, your typical miner out there runs on a, it needs a two twenty volt outlet, uh, so you can't just like plug it into your uh, normal outlet that you plug your computer or phone into. Uh, you might need to use a dryer plug or go in you know, get an electrician to go come in and convert it. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, there are miners out there that do run on 110. Uh, I have one on right next to me. It's called the, uh, this is at one of the hash boards. So these are the boards where all the chips are housed and it does all the work essentially. Uh, but you can pick one of these up pretty inexpensively and a lot of times it makes more sense, but people refer to these as the AK-47 of miners just because they're rock solid and less finicky than some of the other models that have come out. But yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at getting into mining, you want to look at, you know, the cost, the power requirements of the machines that you're getting, uh, your electrical panel, uh, what the capacity is. It's not just like, oh, I want to start mining at home, so I'm going to buy uh, 10S19s, which is the newest uh, machine from Bitmain, and just plug it into you know the wall sockets. You'll you'll need to get some electrical infrastructure in order to do that. You'll need a electrician to come in and convert things in your house. You'll need to buy a power distribution unit to plug your <laughs> machines in, um, and and there's going to be a little bit more work. Uh, but I, I think the best way, it, you know, to get started is to buy an older machine, uh, and like that's nine is my favorite to suggest for people to start and just plug it into your wall, um, wherever, figure out, you know, how, how are you going to mitigate the heat and the noise from this machine? It's a lot easier to mitigate the heat and the noise from an S9 than an S19 or an M30. Um, so that'd be the first place to start for sure. Um, but yeah, and be, even before you do that, you need to go and figure out what the cost of electricity where you live is because in some places it's just not reasonable to mine, uh, in any capacity. Like I have friends in California. Um, I don't know why they live there, but it's, uh, 36 cents a kilowatt hour <laughs> and that, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to profitably mine in that regard. It doesn't make sense um, for sure. But what's, what's really interesting too, you know, we kind of brushed on this uh, before we started recording is you can go out and get industrial and commercial rates for much less than residential rates. I think mining at home is cool, but if you own a business, uh, that's a really cool opportunity to go and, capture cheaper electricity and there's tons of interesting uh schemes that you can run doing that in order to get non-kyc uh bitcoin so yeah yeah exactly and if and if you're looking at like um um if you're if you like yeah if you're talking about business as like a 500 hundred dollar electric like electric bill anyway or something like that where it's higher um you could just kind of you know probably shield a miner or two on there and then um, potentially, um, not saying I'd recommend this, but it just comes to mind. Uh, and then you could even, uh, like if, uh, if it was, uh, an above ground business, you could write that off, um, as an expense <laughs> too. So, um, there's a, there's a lot of interesting, uh, interesting maneuvers there. Um, interesting, uh, interesting indeed. Um, so I guess, um, what, what are these, uh, you know, what's, I guess, what's the, I saw, I guess it was on, t on Twitter, like may maybe a month or two ago. Um, someone had a bunch of, uh, you know, so-called home miners, but a big delivery Midwest, it was 
I guess within a few hours of from a few hours of me, like five hundred dollar five hundred dollar rigs shipped. Um, so I guess like what's what are, what are the costs for the ones that you would you would recommend? What what uh, what uh, sort of investment capital um, are people going to have to uh, are, are going to be looking at? Yeah, I wish I had priced things in Bitcoin uh, before. I don't even know what the price of Bitcoin is today. Um, but yeah, the the S nine ranges somewhere between five uh, hundred to six hundred dollars. Um, and in, according to this calculator I look at today, it's going to mine you six thousand sats a day, or that's like a couple a few dollars so um that's kind of how you put it into perspective and then the, you know you go and you buy the newer higher end higher end machines it's going to cost you about ten thousand dollars or more so somewhere you know seven thousand to ten thousand uh, dollars yeah. depending on the hash rate of the machine and the power consumption efficiency so but then you also have to think about it. it's like what if i get a newer end machine how much is it going to cost to bring in an electrician to change the plugs or if i'm going to use uh you know a dryer plug or something like that which is a great way to to do it as well you know how much is a pdu going to cost or if i'm just going to run a machine how much is it going to cost for the power cord to uh, convert it so it sits in the dryer plug or if I want to change the dryer plug to a plug that's a little bit more conducive for um, the cords that just come with the miners how much does it cost to convert that so mm -hmm. um, and th those things aren't tremendously expensive uh, but they're things that typically don't come to mind when somebody's getting interested in mining right I think because I, I know like that's that's one reason that I the things I did mine I mine was because it didn't require anything special really, um, so um, yeah there's I guess it's it's just additional things you can't just you can't just buy the buy the thing and plug it in per se there's there's other things, um, but anyway I mean as as far as the route for KYC Sats I, I think it's uh, it's certainly worth it but um, I guess um, with uh, uh, with a, I guess a smaller home rig like that, when you're going up against you know big, I guess, uh, and that's not even really a good way to good way to think about it. But if you're competing, you know, I guess competing over the I guess the block reward, um, I guess it's it's applicable. But uh, um, obviously there are you know a lot big you know, big mining farms out there who have a lot higher chance of of getting uh, you know getting the block reward. So um, what are your thoughts on you know like solo mining versus uh, mining pools and what sort of um, I guess what what experiences have or I guess do, do you know of on them? Are people um, doing well solo mining? Are people doing well on on mining pools? Uh, what's your experience? Yeah, uh, real quick, I want to talk oh. before we get to that. Sure. Um, I'm pretty bullish on small scale mining. I don't know how sustainable the big mining pools are uh, because there's a lot of single points of failure. Uh, smaller miners are a lot more mobile. Um, a lot more flexible, uh, have to deploy a lot less infrastructure than these massive uh, mining pools and or mining farms. Uh, and you're going to be a lot less in the crosshairs of the state if you're a smaller miner. Um, but I mean, you just like look at the volatility of, of regulations like China shut down. If you have a 10,000 machine mine, it's going to be a lot harder to move and deploy that equipment than if you have a hundred or even two miners. Um, and when, once you start getting to mining, uh, it, it's kind of like, like Bitcoin in general is a virus that takes over your mind, or at least it has been for me. Um, mining is similar in that regard uh, for me, where now I think about everything and like what's the cheapest electricity prices how do i i get that and it might influence you know where you live and other decisions that you make so that's interesting um solo mining uh i think is kind of silly uh because you like say you're mining with an s9 a single s9 and you're solo mining you have like a one in 20 million chance of actually hitting a block each day uh, so it's kind of comparable to, um, uh, you know, playing the lottery, which I'm not a big fan of personally. Right. Right. Uh, but 
Yeah, mining pools are pretty cool, and you know, there there's definitely been some you know major uh, arguments about which mining pool uh, do I join. You know, what's the best block? You know, payout scheme, um, stuff like that. But what's cool about the mining pool? All you really, all you need to do is, to sign up is uh, have an email address, and what the pool does is it. Uh, you know, makes your payout a bit more consistent. And what you're doing is you're, instead of competing with um, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you pull your resources together to um, compete together. And so, um, yeah, you can go, there's a, let me see what the site is. I'm not going to go to the site, but there, there's a site I like a lot. It has a mining calculator. It's, um, it has a visualization of the different pools that you can join. Join. It's called insights.brains.com. And uh, if you scroll down about halfway through the page, you'll be able to see all the different pools out there uh, that you can join and the amount of hash rate that they have. And I, I think when you're looking at a pool to join, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be dependent on like, who has the highest hash rate because you're you might that pool might mine more blocks uh but you're going to get a smaller payout because you have a smaller share of the hash power in that pool um but from what i've seen you know most of the pools over time you know mine blocks at different rates uh it's it's really based on luck and you have you're probably going to have more luck or mine more blocks if your pool has more hash power uh but you know the idea that one pool is somehow magically better than the other i don't really see it other than you know you can you can go and do research on the payout schemes and kind of decide for yourself but yeah i mean i we we've seen some you know stuff on twitter recently about people solo mining with like usb mm -hmm. yeah. sticks and and i think that's just kind of a you know, silly marketing scheme. So yeah, the likelihood of doing that is very, very small. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess let's, let's talk for a, a minute then um, specifically on prices and just make another, make another point of it. Um, so I'm thinking about, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it. We, I, I don't have fast enough internet here at the, uh, um, at the homestead for, uh, to run a miner, I don't think. Um, but I might at, uh, at the distillery, and um, I guess the the commercial electricity is three three sixty three a kilowatt hour. So is that uh, um, I guess is that pretty reasonable? It's kind of seemed to appreciate that it was, that it was pretty reasonable. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That's about as good as you can get. Okay, right on. Cool, cool. Um, that's, that's incredibly <laughs> incredibly competitive. Well, that's uh, that's that's uh, that's good to hear. So, I guess um, another important component, or a, a good thing to know about if people are going to get into mining, is um, like mining difficulty adjustments, and I guess I guess hash rates. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of uh, I guess lay out some I guess some some definitions and kind of uh, well, what those things are and why they're important to to someone someone who's going to mine? Yeah. So the Bitcoin protocol wants to have a block that processed every ten minutes. And so if a bunch of miners come online and the hash rate goes up, the blocks are going to get mined a lot quicker. Uh, and so there'll be a difficulty adjustment to make it harder for blocks to be solved to try and get that time, um, get that block on schedule to be processed every 10 minutes. And typically, you know, what you see is more and more miners come online over time and, uh, the efficiency of the miners gets better and better. The chips get more powerful. Uh, we just recently saw an announcement about Intel chips coming out uh, for mining, and they look like they're a massive improvement on the cur current iteration of chips, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, but that's generally been what's ha happened in the past is the difficulty goes up very very quickly uh so when you're you know looking at buying a miner and you look at uh um you know the price for it and you plug it into a mining calculator 
one of the assumptions that you you should make is that you're going to be mining less and less Bitcoin over time as that difficulty uh, gets higher and higher. And so, so I have a friend that was mining about a million sats uh, a year ago, and or a million sats a week a year ago, and now it's down to a uh, hundred thousand sats a week. So that amount of Bitcoin is going to be uh, diminishing over time. Now, that's not taking into account a lot of the volatility in the energy markets. Um, hash rate, you know, what it's going to do is about as difficult to predict as the Bitcoin price. I think over time, it's always going to go up. But, you know, today when I'm looking at my calculator, we just recently had a downward difficulty ju adjustment of about, I think, just under 2%, which wasn't massive. Uh, but today, you know, when I'm looking at the calculator, it looks like there's been a big drop off in hash rate. Um, and we're looking at almost a negative 10% uh, adjustment. And so I have no idea what's going on there. And it might not uh, be what happens because the, the hash rate is just kind of a estimation of how much power... Um, how much computing power is on the network uh, depending on how quickly or slowly the blocks are coming in. Uh, but for the average person getting in, I would um, always suggest to assume that the amount of Bitcoin that you mine over time is going to be diminishing as newer, more efficient computers come online and as uh, people deploy more and more equipment. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, very nice, man. Very nice. Um, so I guess, um, from your, I guess, uh, um, you know, you're, you're in the space. Um, what are other, um, what are other benefits, uh, for mining, uh, resources or areas, uh, particularly you think are uh, important to discuss before we, um, kind of get more into kind of the, the, my, my thoughts on the PASNI application of this sort of, 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 uh, of the mining. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think every, a lot of our issues that we're seeing in society, the the totalitarianism of the state comes from state control over the money. And, you know, I just look at Arizona and a lot of other regions uh, that are so dependent on, you know, the federal government or whichever government on the U.S. government in general because of the way the money works. And I think, you know, mining allows for the individual to be a little bit more sovereign because now you have an income stream that isn't dependent on a W-2 job uh, as well as, um, you know, is not necessarily visible to the IRS, which I think is, you know, exciting. Uh, but I think the same goes for regions in general because everybody, you know, is being choked by the federal government is depend not everybody, but um, the regions are dependent on it. And so I feel like Bitcoin mining uh, can allow for regions, communities, and individuals to become a bit more sovereign and, and as well as businesses, because I mean, there's so many businesses out there that have, uh, that have just gotten destroyed over the past uh, two years by, and, and just in general, I mean, the taxes that, they pay is just absurd and uh, completely criminal, but um, by these ridiculous policies and, and Bitcoin mining can come in and be uh, a stream of income to that business as well to help them be a little bit more profitable. Um, so I think that's pretty, pretty exciting. But yeah, as far as, uh, I mean, we're going to see some really interesting stuff like this home mining fa fad that's happening right now is exciting because people are being very, very creative with the way that they uh, repurpose the minor heat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you live in colder climates, um, I mean, we talked a little bit about heating, but I mean, the idea of being able to heat a hot tub with, uh, or a pool in the middle of winter up to, there's a guy named Coin Heated who had a pool in Minnesota and he heated it up to 113 degrees with like six uh, Bitcoin miners. Um Stuff like that is super, super interesting. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, crazy experimentation in that regard. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's amazing to hear. And I guess uh, if people are in uh, in Arizona, um, I guess uh, you you uh, work or I guess uh, you work on educating folks out there and, and have little uh, I guess have have meetups and such. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Tucson Bitcoin? What you do? Um, what you do there? Yeah. So we uh, there's a group of probably six or seven of us that organize meetups across Arizona, and we all have you know, similar values. Most of us are, you know, anarchists or libertarians. Uh, and, you know, the goal is to like help individuals become a bit more sovereign and focusing on Bitcoin only because there's a lot of, you know, shitcoin meetups that, that pop up around that, you know, somebody will walk into and doesn't know anything about anything. And they're told to buy this you know, stupid shit coin because it's better than Bitcoin or, you know, maybe it has better privacy features or, you know, whatever, and just get totally uh, fleeced uh, by these individuals. And so we try and, you know, have a little bit of integrity with what we do. But yeah, we're really, really interested in non-KYC um, uh, Bitcoin and creating these networks of individuals that are able to transact without and operate without coercion. And so Bitcoin mining is definitely a part of that. And we talk about that, uh, but we're also talking about, you know, ways that normal individuals can just go in and purchase uh, Bitcoin, non KYC. And so Bitcoin ATMs have been around a while. I'm not a huge fan of them, uh, but we're, what we're looking at right now is uh, these things called as terminals, which uh, essentially allow an individual to walk in to wherever the vendor is uh, and purchase Bitcoin for cash up to a thousand dollars a day, uh, right there. And it prints you out a little voucher that you scan with your phone. And now the Bitcoin's in your wallet. I think that's much better than, you know, the ATM, uh, model and then the fees are lower. The fees are, you know, only 5% compared to whatever the ATM is, which is, you know, ridiculous. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I think that's incredibly important because I don't, I like, I think Bitcoin's powerful, uh if used correctly and i think there's a lot like the general population the masses are focused on you know how do i make money how do i you know post <laughs> me traveling on instagram or you know me in a car or whatever you know just very silly things they're not focused on uh privacy or taking you know, what's happening in the world around them very seriously and insulating themselves and their families from it and thinking critically. And so I think uh, that's why it's important that we, you know, we have this Bitcoin meetup because of the people that are interested in all the stupid stuff walk in um, and we're, we're talking about things that actually matter. And, you know, sometimes they don't come back or sometimes they get converted in the process of it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's great to hear, and that I guess that's that's been kind of the the realization too over the past couple of years. Is I mean, it's really just all about, um, <clears throat> you know, not all about, but um, you know, it's uh, I guess uh, stacking sats is extremely important. However, you can not really looking at you know what the exchange rate is, just um, getting it however you can, um, especially KYC uh, KYC free. So. Um, yeah, I think mining is a, a great, uh, a great uh, avenue that's becoming more available to folks. And um, I think just uh, in terms of, you know, like a Pasni and Bitcoin mines, like, a, I guess, a decentralized little mining network thing, um, it could be pretty cool. And um, I guess it uh, could be an interesting self, I guess, uh, you know, self-funding uh, mechanism and, and, and all sorts of cool implications there. But uh, um, yeah, I guess um, yeah we can uh, we can uh, I guess move forward onto onto that now. So I guess logistically speaking, um, how do you think a sort of uh, Pasni and Bitcoin uh, you know mining network could look? Um, I guess uh, what sorts of infrastructures uh, we've talked a little bit about it, but like what what infrastructure would be necessary? Um, I guess uh, connection needs like uh, I mean, would satellite internet probably wouldn't be faster? You probably need pretty quick internet, I'd imagine. Um, uh, best security culture practices like uh, I guess additional benefits there, uh, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, there's a ton of interesting things that you can uh, do. I mean, I, I think a decentralized market for mining equipment would be pretty interesting uh, for people to be able to transact if you want to buy a machine or 
if you have a hash board or control board that goes bad, instead of going to one of these, uh, you know, larger marketplaces and, you know, caveat, I work for one of those places. I think it's a great place to buy, uh, because you don't need to, uh, put in your KYC information to do it. Um, but, and you can use Bitcoin, but I think that's an interesting concept to have that decentralized marketplace for mining equipment. Uh, on top of that, you know, not everybody has uh, the infrastructure to run miners. Not everybody lives in a place where uh, you have cheap electricity uh, that makes as much sense. And kind of going back to what you said, you know, trying to stack uh, sats at any cost. I, I agree with that. And that's where, you know, the home miner it's a lot different than, you know, large scale miners. So you're not worried as much about, uh, you know, profitability versus, uh, you know, just stacking sats. And that's, you know, part of the reason why the S9, for example, is a really interesting machine because they're very inexpensive and um, don't use a ton of electricity. Uh, so, but... But yeah, I mean, ho hosting miners at different p people's houses is interesting. I know a guy that uh, sets up all of his friends with miners to heat their home in the winter, and he works out a payout structure with them. I'm definitely, you know, I think what's cool about the Pasnian network is that, you know, there is a level of vetting and, you know, knowing the people that are in there. Um, but there's always, you know, this counterparty risk when you host miners somewhere else uh, that you have to take into consideration and deal with the potential that um, you might not get those <laughs> the machines back. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, I, I wouldn't, you know, feel comfortable, for example, uh, having somebody, you know, within the Pasnian network holding onto my Bitcoin. I wouldn't send them send it to them to hold in their wallets but i might be a little bit more interested in you know letting somebody in the past neon network uh hold on to one of the keys of my multi-sig um so there's definitely like some things that need to be taken into consideration uh there as regards to you know what do you do if something goes bad uh if the miners damage there there's definitely uh you know, potential for issues and, and conflicts to, to happen there. But, you know, something that I've looked at personally is I have friends that have cheap electricity that mine that I've known for a while and trust that I would be willing to send them a couple, uh, you know, S9s to mine for me versus, you know, a big right. machine. So it, it, it just kind of comes, comes down to, uh, you know, your risk tolerance and, uh, and trust of the individual that you're dealing with for sure um, as far as other stuff yeah that definitely makes sense man um that definitely makes sense um and uh yeah this would be a uh, i guess this would be a tier three i guess it'd be the vetted the vetted stakeholder um portion so yeah it would definitely be um definitely be trusted folks um but uh, I also I'm, I'm also curious too, um, like uh, um, I don't know, um, like some sort of a because uh, um, I think I think Jamin talked about this last time he was on, but like uh, just like a decentralized mining network having like a VPN node um, at those locations too, so we'd have our own like it'd be like a trusted VPN service. We could have like four or five hops um versus like uh, proton vpn is um is great but it's only it's still only two hop so like if you could have like a four hop vpn through like trusted you know trusted centers like or i guess trusted you know autonomous zones driver that'd be pretty badass too i think um but yeah that's a little bit of a side mm -hmm. side thing but any thoughts on that any thoughts on my rambling um yeah i mean that's super interesting i haven't looked into anything like that so i couldn't really speak to it with much authority um i'm kind of technically challenged so it's kind of amazing i've gotten this far no i'm i'm with you man i'm with you no it's it's get it's gotten to the point now 
Um, like I, I've I've been interested in some of this crypto anarchy stuff for you know for a number of years, but it's getting to the point. Like, but I'm not like a programmer or developer or anything like that. Um, so like it's getting to a point now. Like the ghost phones are just so easy to use. Like it's it's easier than my my old spy phone. It works better. So like, um, yep. it's to the point where it surpassed the the, the survival society nonsense. Um, same with Jitsi. Like I, I, I mentioned this a number of times, but when I, when I started using this in 2015, you had to download a client, you had to like manually do the encryption steps. Um, like it was, you had to set up an XMPP server. So like, it was like a number of steps to get to the point where we're at now when it's just a link. So like things have gotten, um, have, have advanced, um, have definitely, definitely advanced a lot. Um, so it's definitely curious to see where Yeah, it's go. amazing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, uh, I have graphene running on my phone, oh, yeah. which is, you know, similar concept to, to Calyx, uh, which is what you guys are loading on your phone. And it was pretty easy for me to install. It was pretty phenomenal. Like the, these technologies, um, to operate sovereignly or, or, or just more privately are g getting a lot easier to implement. So like, you know, running a Bitcoin node is not very difficult to do. And I think people try to make it complicated where, you know, you need to get a Raspberry Pi or, um, you know, potentially get in a command line, stuff like that. Uh, but you can just go and get an old laptop uh, at the pawn shop and put a new hard drive in it, you know, pretty inexpensive process to do and download um, the Bitcoin core uh client and run that and begin connecting all your wallets to it and using it a bit more um privately or if you have you know limitations uh you could get a prune node too and there's a awesome website called prudent pruned node today so it's not running the whole blockchain but um that's a lot better option than you know just getting your generic hardware wallet and uh um relying on the hardware wallet providers uh uh node and giving them access to all your transaction information so yeah definitely like a lot to this stuff but i think having the attitude of like i'm going to incrementally uh move to a more private uh minded lifestyle is really interesting yeah yeah, definitely, definitely. So I guess uh, um, we're coming up on about an hour. I don't really have too many, too many other questions. But I mean, since I have you here and you're, um, you know, and you know, um, you've been in bit deeper in Bitcoin for longer than I have, I think, or at least you know, at least uh, deeper in it for for de definitely quite uh, you know more more into uh, this into the ecosystem. But um, I guess um, so. You're familiar with Wasabi Wallet and Samurai Samurai Wallet. Um, there's obviously a lot of drama that happens between those between those things, but I'm curious just on a technological a technological point of view, because um, uh, yeah, especially I've seen I've seen even more recently. Um, but uh, um, I guess what what are your what are your thoughts on on that? So I guess just the te te technology of it and any any thoughts in general. Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, um, I use both. Uh, I don't think that. I mean, there's trade-offs to both and, you know, the privacy world is insane, uh, where everybody has a different opinion of, of what the, you know, best way to go about things is. And I, I think it's very difficult, if not impossible to ever, uh, achieve, you know, perfect privacy. Um, I own firearms because I believe not that they're necessarily going to keep me a hundred percent safe. Uh, there's, you know, always the potential that more people with guns will be able to come to my home, but I own them not only for the ability to protect myself, but to, uh, raise the cost to attack me. And so, you know, it's the same exact concept with, you know, having graphene on my phone is, mm -hmm. it's not a perfect privacy system. Um, there are still ways to monitor and surveil me, uh, but I want to raise the cost to do that and be a little bit more private. And so that's what I would think about, you know, with products like Wasabi and Samurai, um, and 
you know, do a lot of digging and research. What I would say is that um, both have issues. The, the It's very confusing for a newcomer to come in and see, you know, all the mud being um, thrown back and forth. Uh, Samurai, you know, has some things that are definitely questionable about their product uh, that you can mitigate if you run your own node and use the the their service correctly um hmm. but they do things like if you just download the wallet on your phone and are not connected to your node you're relying on their node and they have your information uh which you know they they can point all the fingers towards uh wasabi that they want but that you know is kind of misleading and I think is a major issue uh, for the average person, but yeah, I don't know. I, I try to stay out of it and stay neutral on this one because I just think it's, it's really obnoxious <laughs> to, to look at all the um, garbage that they, they throw at each other. So, I mean, there, there's like, yeah. No, that's, that's totally fair. That's, that's, uh, you know, all, all totally fair. And that's, uh, I think I've, I mentioned that. Um, last time Max Silburn was on it, it does make it so like, um, even for someone like me who's been in the space for a while, like I, I definitely know like that, like a coin join thing, like that's definitely, um, an area where like spooks would love to be involved. Um, so like you gotta be, you just gotta be <clears> careful. Um, anytime you're, you are so like, so like you'll, you'll look at Twitter, Twitter, like you look at, uh, you know, yeah, Twitter and, uh, yeah, see all the shit. And it's like, well, I don't know which one, like. I'm not quite sure which one is best to use and which one's not. It's uh, it's definitely not easy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I would say, you know, if people are really concerned about privacy is to just try and use as... I'm definitely not a privacy expert, um, so I would go and look at stuff like what Matt O'Dell's doing over at on the Citadel Dispatch podcast. He's got some really good stuff on there. And that's generally where I turn to as a resource. Uh, but what I would say is, you know, start operating with non-KYC Bitcoin, uh, earn Bitcoin, uh, charge Bitcoin for good and services. Like that's something that's super interesting to me. Um, I just finished my chicken coop. I need to go and buy chickens, uh, which would, I was hoping to do that this weekend. And one of the things I was hoping to do is bring the eggs to the meetup and, and trade for Bitcoin with the people at the meetup. So now um, I'm beginning to build this, you know, circular economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the lamest things of, that happens in Bitcoin, and I've been guilty of this for years, is like, look at this amazing freedom technology that lets you route around third party intermediaries and not be surveilled. Okay, the first step to use this technology is to go to a third party intermediary uh, put in all your information so that they can surveil you. Um, I think that's super lame. And, you know, why mining is super cool. Why Azteco is super cool. Why earning Bitcoin um, from peers is super cool. And I think, you know, when we have a good amount of people inter interacting that way without touching Cash App or Coinbase or, you know, whatever it is, uh, it becomes very difficult to monitor um people and they won't have to worry as much about things like coin join um though coin join would still be a good practice to participate in so that's that's the perspective and attitude that i've tried to take and you know again i have to say i'm not an expert on the privacy topic and so if somebody's listening they might get mad at stuff i've said which is fine but no, I yeah. think it's I think it's all fair, man. I think it's yeah. I I I yeah. I think I'd I'd say I agree with it all. I mean, ba basically, what you, yeah, what you do is you earn it, um, non KYC, um, and then you you know do security culture best practices as much as you can, and you just stay off the you know the KYC on and off ramps, and um, you know uh, you can kind of blend in pretty well. I think um, hopefully as long as you, you, you yeah you 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 can do some things, um, to to uh, I guess yeah. Just not make it easy and make it yeah KYC and all trackable, um, but uh, anyway yeah that was all fair man um, definitely all fair um, I guess uh, any closing thoughts on uh, Bitcoin mining that you'd like to leave the audience with or anything uh, um, about Bitcoin or self liberation in general? 
Yeah, I mean, I would just say the Bitcoin mining world is one of the most brutal markets out there. Tons of people um, that go out and try to do medium to large scale mines just get destroyed. Um, so I definitely do a lot of research before jumping in. Um, home mining is different. Uh, I think home mining is extremely exciting. Uh, I would suggest, you know, the first thing you do before you consider it is to go and check your local electricity rates. Uh, I mean, man, if you have a access to three cents a kilowatt hour electricity or five cents or you know even six eight cents i think that's a great opportunity to um get involved but the electricity costs uh the, the power companies like to throw in a lot of uh you know random hidden fees uh so i would check that out before like you know for, say for example when i'm mining at home uh after i reach a certain threshold of five thousand um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's like after I hit a thousand kilowatt hours, uh, the rates go up. And then after I hit 5,000 kilowatt hours, the rates go up again. Uh, but for some commercial, um, industrial, uh, schemes, like there's up in Phoenix, the power company, uh, will charge people, uh, 11 cents a kilowatt hour up until you hit that 5,000 kilowatt hour threshold and then it drops it down to five cents. Uh, so there's, you know, a different, a ton of different, uh, you know, pricing structures depending on your power company. And they're not always the most forthcoming with what those are. So it's, it's definitely a major challenge. Um, but yeah, that's one of my last thoughts, but yeah, I'm super excited about what the, um, what you're doing with the podcast and publish com publishing company and the Pasnia network. So definitely uh, something to watch for in the future. Right on, man. Well, I, uh, I definitely appreciate it. That's uh, yeah. All, uh, all really great information. I I'm definitely appreciative. And um, so what, um, where can people find uh, toxic airwaves? Uh, po your podcast is on uh, YouTube. It's Monday nights. So uh, you want to tell people about that, where they can find it and anything else you'd like to plug? Yeah, we're on YouTube till we get banned. Um, we're we're trying to be edgy. I mean, I think there's a lot of value to just not conforming to whatever the, uh, uh, you know, the, the censors and the ruling class want you to conform to. So if we get banned, that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll go to another platform. And then if we get kicked off that, we'll just have the show on a Jitsi uh, room. Uh, but yeah, we're, right now we're on YouTube. Um, it's a show where we're just trying to have fun. It, it goes off the rails all the time. Uh, so it's somewhat unstructured, but we have people calling in that we go along uh, with that. But yeah, it, I would say like if you're in Arizona, check out the Arizona Bitcoin Network. Uh, that's a great place to be. And I think there's a ton of tremendous amount of value to participating in local Bitcoin meetups because I think that's where you'll find the remnant and that's where you'll find people that are actively engaging in self-liberation uh, and are a lot more open to things than, you know, other uh, venues. So true. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. Um, right on. Well, uh, thanks again for coming on and uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll do a more, more collaboration in some fashion in the future. So I'm um, looking forward to that and uh, um, yeah, until next time, man. Appreciate it, Shane. All right, guys. Uh, big thanks to... Uh, <clears throat> oh, gosh. Get switched over here. Okay, there you go. All right, big thanks to uh, Alex uh, at Tucson Bitcoin uh, on Twitter for coming on to tell us all about Bitcoin mining uh, and for laying uh, laying out the foundational knowledge for uh, the hopeful coming uh, passing of Bitcoin mines. Uh, so I guess here's the question: just uh, maybe maybe this can call, all come together. It'd be it'd be, it'd be incredible. But uh, any passing is interested in contributing or uh, contributing to the Second Realm Network in this manner. Uh, not ex uh, sure exactly how it would look or uh, come together exactly, but uh, if you handle the setup and maintenance, we could talk about the rest. Uh, investment in the mining equipment, uh, you know, operating fees, um, you know, X number of satoshis a month, uh, etc. So if this sounds like you, please do get in contact, uh, Shane at libertyunderattack.com, uh, or reach out on Telegram if you'd like. Uh, let's start laying the logistical framework uh, for making this a reality. 
Uh, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. And uh, always remember, Vanu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. See you guys. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. LibertyUnderAttack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The intent of the Ghostpad is to offer a complete security and privacy hardened computer system that is built from the ground up to be an effective direct action countermeasure for those who want to actively resist the privacy intrusions of the, the entire surveillance state Hydra, both public sector and private sector. A user-friendly computer that the owner maintains exclusive control over every aspect of its operation and has complete control over who accesses what data. A ghost pad is your virtual corner of the room where the cameras, microphones, and other data collection devices have no power. After all, power comes from ownership, which is exclusive control. Unlike practically any other available option, when you buy a ghost pad you are truly its owner. And while the masses beg and bleed to their political corporate masters to loosen their chains, ghost pad owners can use their systems as virtual bolt cutters and cut themselves free. Ghost pads are high-quality business rugged laptops that have had the security compromising system firmware, BIOS firmware, Intel management engine, etc., removed and replaced with more secure, free and open source alternatives. The closed source binary BIOS firmware has been removed from the system board and replaced with free, as in freedom, alternatives as well as the Intel management engine also being neutralized. That combination makes them more secure by design, and preemptively thwarts any attempts by threat actors, both public and private, to gain access by exploiting its vulnerabilities, either by an engineered in and hidden backdoor, or a zero-day exploit in the factory, supplied firmware or the Intel management engine. Perhaps the most important security privacy enhancing feature these systems have, is the neutralizing of the aforementioned Intel management engine, I'm. The IM is a separate computer and a computer that is embedded into all Intel platforms made since 2008. It has its own operating system called Minix. It operates out of band meaning that your primary CPU has no access to monitor what it is doing, and it has direct access to all the hardware that your primary CPU does, making it the ultimate embedded spying device. If you can't audit what it's doing, it's always on when the computer is plugged in, or has battery power, it has its own network interface with its own MAC address that can bypass any system firewall configuration, it has its own storage you have no access to, it can access your microphone, camera, keyboard, can record keystrokes, and display, can screenshot your encrypted communications, while you are reading and writing them. The IM can only be disabled, by modifying the system's firmware. That can only be accomplished by using an external programmer to reprogram the chip that stores the system's firmware. Only select laptop models can be modified. 
we concentrate on the compatible models with the highest performance available. We offer models that are 2x as powerful as any configuration sold and supported by Lenovo. Transitioning your computing activity to privacy-hardened platforms is a direct action strategy to resist the attempts at total omnipresence by the surveillance state. To put it simply, these systems are some of the few available, that are likely compromised in some way on the firmware level, so they are some of the most secure, and private available for use cases where, but those attributes are the most important. It is also why systems configured this way are considered as ideal to use as a base, to install a security privacy hardened OS, such as Cubes OS, Parrot OS, or other privacy-focused Linux distributions, on. To view the full selection of ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools available via Liberty under attack publications, just visit libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. What are you waiting for? Step up your security culture today. Again, libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. Liberty under attack publications, share your story, find your freedom. the second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of Second Realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been van nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vance, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the statist forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertyunderattack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.